So I've been working off and on for the last couple months, developing the processes and sort of getting my head into how to actually forge the railing components that go in here. And it didn't make sense for me to bring you guys in on that until right now, because I have the newel posts and the cap on this little pony wall and everything where it goes. So now my template will make a little more sense. I made templates quite a while ago representing the shape that I have to work with. I can take these back and forth to my shop, check fit, verify spacing on the pickets, make sure that it's code compliant. So this is in general terms what's gonna go into this space. These templates are very specifically exactly what I'm gonna be fitting to. And so now it's time to go back to the shop, show you the rest of the process and sort of finish up putting what I've been looking forward to for the last long period of time into this house, which is some hand forged banister. Well, it's been a long time coming, but I think I am ready to commit myself to the spacing on this drilling jig that will, after drifting, create this spacing on the penetrations for the pickets, which I think is going to end up with nice, even spaces, code compliant, including at the ends of the banisters where they butt into the newel posts in the wall. I think it'll probably be the same spacing within a little bit, but accounting for the gain in length with the drift, accounting for how to keep the holes evenly spaced, I think we're ready to weld this thing up. Something that I learned that I didn't anticipate is that when you're drilling on a slope, it's hard, right? I mean, that's what this jig is for, is to make sure the drill bit doesn't walk down the hill. So it's kind of a mistake to oil your cut. You know, a lot of times you think about oiling a drill bit when you're cutting through steel, and that's good as a coolant and as a lubricant. But I learned you don't really want to do that when you're trying to drill on an angle. What you want to do is slow down the, the rotation, like slow. You want to sharp a bit as you can put in there and just leave the oil out of there, at least until the hole is well established, because the tendency becomes for the bit to walk down the hill and sort of wear away the downhill side of your drilling jig. And that wasn't a big deal using this jig, but when I used the piece that was already drilled as the jig, it elongated some of the holes and they still worked, but it was close. So this was the first hurdle that had to be jumped and the first wheel that had to be invented, and it worked okay. Well, it's taken a long time for me to come up with what I thought was a, a system with a reasonable chance of accuracy. I've drilled these holes. I've used my drilling jig. I think that we are very close to what I wanted. I think the space at the end is gonna be about right. As long as the stretch on the drift doesn't amount to too much. We will be code compliant and it's gonna look good, which means it is good. So now all I have to do is use this one for the template for drilling three more pieces exactly like this and we'll be ready to start the really hard work of uh, heating these up, chamfering them, and drifting a 5 8 square hole out of a 9 16 round hole at a 38 degree angle. What was I thinking? There were a couple of technical problems presented by this, how to attach the handrail in a way that looks good and works good, but that was the second and easier problem. The real problem was how to drift square holes at a 38 degree angle in a piece of half by two. So I'll show you what I had to kind of figure out in order to make that happen. And so far, the uh, system seems to be working. So these are the two drifts that I forged last night out of S7. Slightly different in shape, gotta be ground. The one on the right obviously was the second one. 
much better. I punched the holes for the set screw instead of trying to drill it this time. Turns out I can be taught. We'll grind these to size and shape and taper and see how they work. So I've got one of these bad boys made and it's pretty close. It's nice and square. It's about the right size. I am going to have to move the center of that hole. I've got to, this has got to rotate just a couple of degrees counterclockwise in the, in the uh, fly press in order to be square to the long axis of the piece. I think I can do that with a burr. It is certainly a hard material, too hard to do the whole thing with a burr. It just doesn't cut at all. But I think I can move the side of that hole over just a little bit. In the meantime, I'm going to copy this so I have two, and then we'll try to get to work. So now I've got to build a ramp on the fly press that will support those pieces as they're being drifted. It's the next, uh, it's the next riddle in uh, sort of a modern effort to do what I think the old timers used to do almost without even thinking about it. Not, it's not square with the world. Yeah, got a little reveal there that'll help me. Lay this on. So we rigged up this ramp, we extended it so that it's supported on both ends, and we use punch lube to make sure that you can get it out. It goes, going in is one thing, getting it out is quite another, but there's a lot of these holes and we're quite a ways through it. We have just maybe 30% of them left, shouldn't take over about a day and a half. And uh, all in all, I am vastly relieved because it looks like this, this research and development is going to pay off and I'm actually going to be able to use the pieces that come out of the shop. Now a propane forge is a wonderful thing, but this is a classic example of the necessity of a coal forge in a shop. A blacksmith can draw a short intense heat in a piece like this without getting the entire bar so hot that you can't handle it easily. So the first heat I use to just chamfer all four corners. This is the top bar. And so a person's hand is going to be touching and you'll be able to see all four of the corners on the long run of this. And a chamfer just makes any piece of metal look better. It gives light a place to reflect. So I pretty much have to waste the first heat just chamfering from the last place I worked as far as I can into the cold part of the bar. And back to the heat. So it takes three heats per hole. The first heat I just use to chamfer the edges and maybe sort of mark the drift. The second heat, I get about 90% of the drift taken care of and grind off the extra material that gets pushed to the back. And then the third heat, I finish it up and get the bar straightened up.
that'll hang there because of the metal, that, metal that's been pulled out of the bottom that's stuck in my jig. I'm gonna go grind it off. So everything about blacksmithing is slow. I mean, there's a reason that the world went to machine shops and arc welders, but everything about blacksmithing is beautiful too, that just the way the metal responds and the connections looks nice, and that's what we're doing here. I'm getting about one of these holes drifted about every 12 or 15 minutes, because I've got to heat three different times and then just the handwork. But I can tell you if I didn't have this fly press, which by the way belongs to Ken Jordan, if I didn't have this fly press, I don't know how I would do it. I just, I don't think it could be done. It would become ridiculous. And as it is now, it just sort of strains credibility, but it's gonna be a beautiful railing that can be made in no other way. So I've got about another, probably two full days of drifting holes, and then probably four days of making the last components and assembling them. I shudder to think how much time's gonna be spent on this, but it makes me smile to think of how it's gonna look from now on. So if you're a blacksmith, Think about a fly press. If you're a fabricator, count your blessings. Well, I'm done putting the square holes in the angled portion of the banisters. I've had my hands full here. This ramp on the fly press made it possible. Don't know how I would have done it without that. They turned out perfectly. You'll see that when I start to assemble it, hopefully. But in the meantime, it's time to cut apart the ramp, the machine. Every machine you make is a prototype, and then you have to adjust it and tweak it. The only thing I would do differently on this, for those of you who might tackle this someday, is I would have brought these vertical supports probably under this lengthwise because I got just a little bit of deflection right there, which I think sort of exaggerated the distortion in the piece as I would pull it out. I, I found out that I needed to grind away the shoulders on the square side on the uphill side because that was making contact with the 916th hole earlier than the other side. 
So it's a kind of a offset taper going from the 5 8 square down to the round tip. But aside from that, it worked as advertised and it turned out fine. And so now we, nothing remains but to just cut it apart, put it in the scrap pile, and maybe someday repurpose it for something else. Okay, I forged these things, mostly just put a chamfer on them down to within two inches of the end. Did it at a fairly low temperature because mostly what I was trying to do was to scale them just a little bit and then knock the scale off. And then I let them cool and then I wire brushed them. And now I've warmed them back up to, I don't know, a couple 300 degrees. And I'm gonna put some melted Johnson's paste wax on them as the interior finish. One of these is the top, one of these is the bottom. The bottom is only chamfered on one side, which means this is the bottom. And with the angle coming this direction, the bottom goes down there. It's too long right now, of course. The top is chamfered on both sides, but one side is the presentation side, and that is told by where the grinder marks are. So this is the top. It's got to swap ends like this. Well, it's way, way too early to curl. But part of the brain cramp that this whole thing was in laying out the holes and drifting to square is that every time you drift one of these holes square, it grows. They get further apart every time you run that drift in and stretch them out. But I wanted to drift them square so we get that little bulge. It's a frog eye that happens on the side and only a blacksmith can do it. So I tried to account for the stretch. And as it turns out, I'm within an eighth of an inch of having the same distance between the, new, the wall and the first picket and the newel post and the first picket. We're within just a little bit of having an even space at the beginning, at the end, and in between all of these things. And I think I can uh, attribute that much more to good luck than to good management. Well, we've got all these little attachment points made. I don't know what to call them except 90 degree bends. I've got a jig built that, I don't know if you can see this. It holds these things in a very similar attitude. It holds this thing square to the table and it holds this thing parallel to the table and I just kind of estimate the right projection 
and then I can back weld these. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and assemble what I have drilled, and then we'll have to drill the top and bottom plates for the angled segments, they'll be harder. But we'll be well towards it once we get these things installed because then it's just a matter of installing the pickets and riveting this closure plate onto the top plate. I don't know if that's what I should call them, but that's what we get.
Well, I've got to say that this railing project was a blast. It was big fun, and I think about exactly the same way that skydiving or bungee jumping is big fun. It's big fun if the parachute opens. It's big fun if the bungee cords don't break and if they are the right length. And this was big fun because architectural ironwork is fabulous and there's pressure because unlike some blacksmithing like knives and swords and you know that sort of thing architectural ironwork has to fit and in this case it had to fit before the open house which was going to start one month from the date of our installation thankfully it did fit Thankfully, it's code compliant. Thankfully, the open house went off without a hitch. And thankfully, now, I get to get back into my blacksmith shop a lot. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work.